These are words from Psalm 145. Let us worship our God and sovereign and bless God's name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. The Lord's greatness is unsearchable, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to those who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. May our mouths speak the praise of the Lord, and all things living bless God's holy name forever and ever. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Hear these words from Psalm 66. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what God has done for me. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened and has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not rejected my prayer nor withheld steadfast love from me. Trusting in the assurance of God's love, let us lay aside our defenses and honestly confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. God of all mercy, we confess before you and each other that we have not always been faithful to you. We have missed opportunities to do good. We have withheld our love because we were afraid. Forgive us our sins, both those we commit deliberately and those that we allow to overtake us. Take away our fear and set us free to live glad and generous lives 
serving you in all we do through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Here is good news. Christ Jesus came that we might have life, life in all its fullness, to forgive our failure, to accept us as we are, to set us free from the power of evil, and to renew us in his image. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says about how we respond to God's love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And the Psalter reading is Psalm 90, verses 1 through 12. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger. By your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days pass away under your wrath. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. Even then their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. So teach us to count our days, that we may gain a wise heart. It's time for a word for the children. Today, I am thinking about the special gifts and talents that God gives each of us. Let's look in my gift box to see what I'm talking about. Maybe God gifted you with a musical talent like singing or playing an instrument. Some of you may have been given athletic skills, which make you very good at playing a sport. 
Maybe you have intellectual gifts, so you do very well in school. Some of you may have artistic talent. Some of you may be good at dancing or acting. God gives each and every one of us at least one special gift or talent, and he expects us to use those gifts. He doesn't want them to go to waste. In the Bible, Jesus tells many parables. A parable is a story that teaches a lesson. And today, we will hear the parable of the talents. This story starts with a man who went on a long trip. Before he left, he called his servants together and gave each of them a part of his wealth to take care of while he traveled. While he was gone, two of the servants worked hard and doubled the wealth given to them but the third servant buried his boss's money. When the boss returned, he asked the servants to share what they did with the gifts he gave them. The boss told the two who doubled the gift, well done, because you used what I gave you well, I will give you much more. Then the third servant told the boss, I was afraid. So I took what you gave me and I hid it in the ground so that it would be safe. The boss was angry and disappointed with the third servant. The boss took the money from the servant and gave it to the one who already had the most. He explained, those who make good use of what they have been given will be given more, but gifts will be taken away from those who do nothing. What can we learn from this story? Well, you all know what this is. It's a Frisbee. But pretend for a moment that you do not know what this is and that you have never seen one before. You might think it's a dinner plate or maybe it's a hat. Or perhaps it's a tool that's good for digging in the sand. It could be just about anything, but it isn't. It's a Frisbee. And the person who created the Frisbee made it for a purpose. The purpose of a Frisbee is to fly. The Frisbee isn't very impressive to look at, is it? In a world of high-tech electronic toys, it is pretty plain and simple. But boy, can it fly. Sometimes you and I may look at the talents that God has given to others and think that God hasn't given us very much talent. Maybe we feel plain and simple. We might even be tempted to hide our talent. But when we use our God-given talent to be all that God intended us to be, boy, can we fly. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to use the talents you have given us to be what you intended us to be. Give us the courage to use these gifts to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we have gifts to bring, it is because of God's free mercy. For all things are God, and everything we have is a gift from God's hand. With glad thanksgiving, we offer our gifts to God. Let us pray. We bring you our gifts, O God, with glad and grateful hearts. Grant that with our gifts we may also offer you a ready mind and a willing spirit so that your love may be shown in our daily living through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Guide us now, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we might see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of the prophet Zephaniah, reading chapter 1, verse 7, and verses 12 through 18. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth will be consumed. For a fool, a terrible end, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. And the epistle reading from Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. In the Gospel lesson from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, 
to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God is the correct liturgical response to the reading of Scripture. But after listening to today's readings, we might more likely want to say something like, yikes, you can't miss the ominous tone in today's readings. The prophet Zephaniah and the apostle Paul speak of the day of the Lord, a day of wrath, one that will come like a thief in the night. And in the parable from Jesus' own lips, as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pretty scary stuff. This parable of the talents is one of a series of parables of judgment that are in the latter chapters of Matthew's Gospel, and all of them are rather ominous. There is the parable of the master who comes home unexpectedly to discover that the servant he left in charge has been beating his fellow servants and is subsequently severely punished. The parable of the ten bridesmaids waiting for the wedding celebration, five who were prepared and five who were not, and those who are unprepared are shut out of the banquet. And the parable of the last judgment the Son of Man comes in his glory to judge the nations, separating people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. A time of judgment is coming, says Matthew. You won't know when, you won't know where, you won't know how. Just know this, it's unavoidable and it's likely to be a very big surprise. All of these concluding parables in Matthew's Gospel share some things in common. First, the main character in the story is absent 
or hidden for much of the time. The master goes away on a journey. The bridegroom is delayed in his return. The king is unrecognized in the persons of the poor, the stranger, the sick. Both those who were compassionate and those who were not respond in the same way. Lord, when did we see you? So all these parables are about God's judgment on a world from which God seems absent or is mysteriously hidden. And isn't that often our experience? Where is God today in the midst of a pandemic? Where is God when the doctor comes into the hospital room and says, I'm sorry, I have some bad news? Where is God today when refugee and immigrant children are taken from their parents and lost in the system? Where is God when it seems that truth is forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne? How do we respond to this hidden or seemingly absent God? In the stories that Jesus told, those who are rewarded in the end are those who expected and believed that the absent master would return and who lived their lives on the basis of that expectation and trust. So the question for us is, can we keep trusting even when God seems to have left the scene? The second thing these parables have in common is that at the beginning of the story, everyone is an insider. No one is left out. All of the bridesmaids, the wise and the foolish, were invited to the wedding. All of the servants were entrusted with a portion of their master's property, some more, some less, but all were included in their master's trust. All the people who appeared before the king, those on the left and those on the right, had had opportunity to welcome the stranger, to feed the hungry, to visit the sick. So at the beginning of the story, everyone is included. What the servants did or did not do during their master's absence that they judge themselves. It's whether the bridesmaids were prepared or not prepared during the bridegroom delay that determines whether or not they go to the party. But at the beginning, no one is left out. Everyone belongs. It's what you do or don't do during the wait that makes the difference. And thirdly, each of these stories reflects the biblical notion that history is going somewhere. The course of this world and God's action in it are moving toward their target. Life is not an endless recycling meaningless recycling. History has purpose and direction. Time will come to an end. And because history has purpose, our participation in that history has meaning. Our decisions and our actions do make a difference. Now, Reformed theology has rightly emphasized the sovereignty of God, the strong affirmation that God rules and God is in control. But sometimes I think that that belief in the sovereignty of God can become distorted and become a cover for laziness. God is in control, so there's nothing I can do that will make any difference. That sounds more like fatalism than faith. In contrast, this parable assumes that human beings by their actions or inactions do make a difference, that we are entrusted with great responsibility, given a good measure of freedom, and therefore will be held accountable. Consider the trust that this master places in his servants. A talent was worth about a lifetime's of wages. So even the one-talent servant was being entrusted with a tremendous amount of wealth. Consider what God has entrusted to us. Our children, our loved ones, care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, care for this planet. 
We say in God we trust, but also true and more surprising is God trusts in us. And with that trust comes a great deal of freedom. The master entrusted his property to his servants but gave no specific instructions about what to do with it. He leaves it for them to decide. They could have played the horses for all we know. What do you do with the resources and time that God has given you? It's up for you to decide. We trust that God has something in mind for us. We trust that God wants us to use our gifts to God's good purpose. But we are left to discern what that is through prayer, through conversation, through careful thinking. There's no rule book with everything spelled out. God has given us a great deal of freedom. The servants exhibit various responses to that trust in freedom. The first two move out immediately, went to work, and won more talents. They show eagerness, energy, enthusiasm. They're delighted with their freedom and grateful for the opportunity to please their master. But they're also taking a risk. There's no guarantee that they would succeed. It's possible that they could have lost it all. In contrast, the words used to describe the actions of this third servant convey not energy and enthusiasm, but timidity. He went away rather than moved out, dug a hole rather than went to work, and hid his talent rather than gained more. He's not motivated by love or loyalty to his master, but by fear. He plays it safe. And the master is not impressed. This is a master who holds his servants accountable. We're expected to do something with the grace God has given us. When God extends grace, when God freely forgives, we are expected to do business with it, to keep it moving, to forgive others as we have been forgiven, to bless others as we have been blessed, not to keep it under wraps, not so we can live some low-risk, oh-so-safe spiritual life in which we neither risk much nor love much. There's dignity in being held accountable. There is dignity in being treated as a mature, responsible human being, called to account for what we've been given, held to our word for what we have promised. What if the master had said to the timid and lazy servant, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. I never expected anything from you anyway. What you do or don't do doesn't make a bit of difference. I really don't care. There's no dignity in that. This servant imagined his master to be a harsh man, and that fear led to a self-focused, narrow, and overly cautious faith. One of the more disturbing statistics to come out of this recent election cycle is from the Lifeway Research Group, an organization that was formed to provide data to churches in their decision making. Prior to the election, they did a nationwide survey asking this question. Who do you hope your vote for president benefits the most? Among the choices were people nationwide who are like me, people our country has failed, myself and my family, people nationwide who are different from me. And the results showed that evangelical voters were more likely than others to say that their, they hoped their vote most benefits people like them. And they were also less likely to say they hope their vote benefits people our country has failed said the executive director of LifeWay Research, 
Few Americans with evangelical beliefs will be casting a Good Samaritan vote on Election Day. Instead, most will vote to benefit those like them or their own family. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. And fear leads to a narrow, self-focused, playing it safe kind of life. Note also that the servants who gained more talents for their master were praised not because they were successful, but because they were faithful. Well done, good and trustworthy servants. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will give you even more responsibility. And the servant who buried the talents was condemned not because he was a cheat or did evil, but because he did nothing. And he did nothing because he was lazy and he was afraid. He was afraid of his master who he imagined to be a harsh man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. And the master's response You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Very well, then that is who I will be to you. I leave you to your self-created, distorted perception of my nature. The lazy and timid servant got the master he imagined. The psalmist said of God, With the loyal, you show yourself loyal. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. The pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself perverse. In other words, if we want to know God, then we need to let our lives be shaped by the God we are wanting to know. The kinds of lives we live are huge factors in influencing our access to the truth, especially the truth that is God. When we live for others, for the hungry, the homeless, and the hurting, then we come close to this God who is a God for others, the God who is love, the God who is justice. When we live generous, risk-taking, self-emptying lives, then we come close to the God who emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. The lazy and timid servant imagined his master to be a harsh man, reaping where he did not sow. What if instead he had come to his master and said, Master, I know that you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are good to all and your compassion is over all. I took a risk with your money. I so wanted to please you. I gave it my best, but it didn't work out. I'm afraid I have nothing to offer you but my failed efforts. How then would his master have responded? Would he have condemned him because he wasn't successful? Or would he have said something like, you ventured out in faith. I recognize the sincerity of your efforts, your faithful efforts on my behalf, your willingness to risk for me, Speak more of who you are and of who you think me to be than your success or your failure. You trusted in my steadfast love, and that is what you shall have. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. What matters is not whether we succeed or fail. What matters is whether we dare to venture something for God, or if out of fear, 
we choose to play it safe. I conclude with this prayer by Thomas Merton, and I hope that each of us can make it our own. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Let us now together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. Let us pray. Holy and right it is to give you thanks and praise, great God, our Creator. You are the maker of every atom and molecule, the fashioner of far-flung stars and galaxies, shaper of planets and author of our lives. We thank you for the gift of life and for this planet, our island home, for all in it that is lovely and pure, for all that speaks to us of your goodness and your wisdom, for all the gifts that supply our needs and delight our senses, we give you thanks. Give us such a sense of wonder and love for all that you have made that we may wisely tend that which you have entrusted to our care and generously share your gifts with all your creatures so that they and we may live full and abundant lives, rejoicing in your goodness and giving you praise. Look with love, O God, on those portions of your world where creation is languishing. Forgive us for our folly and selfishness that have polluted 
your waters, harmed your good earth. Help us to work with you to heal, to restore, and to renew. Lord of the nations, we pray for our country. We pray for our president and president-elect and for their staff and other government officials in this time of transition. Despite their differences, help them work together for the good of our nation. Help them and help us all to put away rancor and bitterness and to work to heal divisions and build bridges of understanding so that whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, we might think about and value and seek these things. Lord of history, you pray for our world, especially those places and peoples where there is oppression or poverty or conflict. We pray for the people of Yemen and Syria, Ethiopia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. We pray that leaders of nations and those in power might lay aside the weapons of war and find ways to settle differences without violence. Bless relief workers and peacemakers and those who care for those who are most vulnerable. O oh God, healer of our every ill, we pray for all of us suffering in this pandemic, whether of illness or loss, of loneliness or anxiety. Especially we pray for those on the front lines, for health workers and teachers, for grocery store clerks and public servants. Help us all to be patient and gentle with one another. Be near, O oh God, to all those who are bearing wounds of suffering and grief. Surround them with a sense of your present love. Draw them and us to the wells of faith that have sustained generations through times of trouble and trauma. Bless your servants who care for those who are hurting. Grant them a gentle touch that is your touch. Give them compassionate words that are your words. Grace them with a strength of presence that is rooted in your strong and steadfast love. Lord God, you have called us always to be ready to give an account of the hope that is in us. And you have promised your spirit to guide us. Help us this week to be open to opportunities to serve so that in the words we speak, in the places we go, among those with whom we live and work, in the way we conduct ourselves, we might reflect your love and be instruments of your grace, leading others too to the way of Jesus Christ. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.